things you have never heard anyone say about sexual orientation. Hi folks, I'm Janet Walker. I am the author of a novel called Amazed by Her Grace and a few other self-published works. And the only reason I make that clarification is because there are at least three other Janet Walkers who have published and two write about God. But I am not those Janet Walkers. It's important that you know that because of what I'm going to confess in this recording. I don't want to misrepresent those other women. So I am the Janet Walker of Atlanta and Augusta, Georgia, who is a writer of fiction. More importantly, I am a woman who for more than 30 years has tried to balance my beliefs as a Christian with the reality of being a woman who is not entirely what the Bible prompts Christians to be, which is heterosexual. I am a woman who possesses an orientation that is out of step with my belief system. I want to talk to you today about that because after decades of giving it deep thought and after years of living first for God and then not for God, I have received what I believe is one solution. Now, honestly, this solution came to me six years ago in 2009. It poured through me is the only way I can describe it. But I didn't speak it publicly at the time because I thought that doing so would make me a hypocrite telling people how to cope with orientation as they serve God, when I knew at that time that I had told God I would give up anything for him except my devotion to my orientation. And I was living my life to prove that. But now, praise God, I have finally placed him above my orientation, and I am ashamed for being so selfish as to not do it sooner than I did because I would have felt free to share this message six years ago with those of you who have this dilemma. How do you become or remain a good Christian when you have a non-hetero or what I call an other sexual orientation? So here you are, a member of a Christian religion or church that you love. Not only that, you love God, you love Christ, you love righteousness, you love the Bible. But as a member of this religion or church, you are part of a group that teaches that heterosexuality is the only sexual orientation approved by God. You embrace that belief because it's what your beloved religion teaches and because you sincerely believe it's what the Bible teaches. Yet you know in your heart of hearts that you are not heterosexual. You are either partially heterosexual or not at all. What do you do? Now those of you who are heterosexual would probably say it's simple, just stop being that way. Stop being non-heterosexual. Others might say it's simple, just stop being a member of that church or that religion if that's what it teaches. Well to that I say this, the people to whom I am appealing in this discussion are those who don't want to stop being members of their Christian religion or of a particular church. They believe it to be the true path to God. So leaving their way of worship is not an option. In fact, I want to try to help that person remain a part of that Christian religion if it is a healthy vehicle for him or her. To those who would say, just stop being non-heterosexual, <laughs> I would venture to say that only a heterosexual would say that. Because those of us who are what I call other sexual, that's my word, I created it. Those of us who are authentically other sexual and are not just engaging in same-sex behavior because it's a popular trend or circumstantially convenient or our favorite celebrity encourages it, no, those of us who are innately other sexual, no, you can't just stop being other sexual. Just as you can't stop being heterosexual because somebody tells you to stop. Now, you can stop behaving in some ways, in a way that an other sexual behaves, but you can't stop being other sexual. Why is that? Well, first note that in this discussion, other sexual means either homosexual, or bisexual. 
Homosexual, of course, means being attracted to those who are the same sex that you are. And bisexual means being attracted to both sexes, though not in equal measure or quality. Now, because of that, I also refer to bisexuality as being of mixed orientation. Also note that being other sexual does not mean wanting to be the other sex. Now, that's a matter of biology and psychology not matching, and I am not authorized to discuss that. My term, other sexual, refers only to those individuals who know that they were born with the right bodies. They don't believe they are the opposite sex. They are simply oriented toward the same sex. And what does that mean to be oriented toward? What really is orientation? When I hear the word orientation, I think of the pattern of grains in a piece of wood. If you examine wood, you'll notice that the grains or the molecules of growth are pulled in a definite direction, creating a pattern of fibers. Woodworkers call this the orientation of the grains. Now, in one piece of wood, the grains might flow in one direction only. In another piece of wood, you might have grains going perhaps in two different directions in the same piece of wood. But what is true is that those directions of orientation don't change no matter what you do to that piece of wood. You can cut it, carve it, sand it, gloss it, and glaze it. No matter what you do to that piece of wood, the orientation of the grains remains the same. You can use the piece of wood as a table, a door, a ball, a toy airplane. No matter how you use that piece of wood, the orientation of the grains doesn't change. It's the same with humans. It doesn't matter whether you dress in the clothes of a Christian or the cloak of a prophet. Your orientation doesn't change. It doesn't matter whether you enter into a marriage or remain single. No matter how you dress yourself, no matter how you use your body, your orientation, the direction in which your molecules of interest and desire are pointed, does not change. Another example to demonstrate the intrinsic nature of orientation. Let's say you have a woman who's 30 years old, and for all of her life, she has been heterosexual, undeniably, unquestionably. In her adult life, she's only slept with men and has only wanted to sleep with men. But at the age of 30, she decides to become a Catholic nun. Now, what does that mean about her sexual activity? Well, obviously, her sex life ceases. She becomes celibate. Now, let's say we revisit her 30 years later. She has been a faithful Catholic nun all that time, which means that in 30 years, she has not slept with a man. Do we then say she is no longer a heterosexual woman? <laughs> of course not. Why? Because her orientation doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't change. Now, her activity changed. Her behavior changed, which means that likely her thinking changed in order to facilitate the change in behavior, but her orientation didn't go anywhere. It didn't change. It's the same with bisexuality, or mixed orientation, and homosexuality, states of being about which I have some authority to speak. As a bisexual woman, I am partially heterosexual and partially homosexual. I can speak with great authority about being bisexual. It's its own orientation. And I can speak with limited authority about homosexuality, since that is partially what I am. It's one of the ingredients of my orientation recipe. Now, even though I say orientation is fixed and doesn't change, I'm not trying to create an excuse we can use to fully follow our orientation. I'm merely saying that those of you who became Christian and expected that God was going to change you are probably disappointed and frustrated and want to give up. Well, he didn't fail you. You had the wrong expectations. Your orientation's not going to go anywhere. Why is that? Because orientation is who you are. It's what you are. And it's about so much more than who you sleep with. In fact, to say sexual orientation, in my opinion, limits 
the meaning of the word. Because orientation influences so many of the choices we make that have nothing to do with sex. This is why you can look at a person and sometimes figure out their orientation without ever seeing them in bed with anybody. In fact, I believe that if economics were not a factor, many of the choices we make would be influenced solely by our orientation. The car that we drive, <laughs> the architectural style of the home that we buy, the music we like, the clothing that we wear, even the job that we choose to do, all of these non-sexual matters are influenced by our orientation. This is because orientation is who you are, it's what you are, not just who you feel drawn to sleep with. Don't be fooled when you hear an orientation label. Someone says, I'm bisexual, or I'm homosexual, or I'm heterosexual. Don't assume you know what that means. Because in my opinion, orientation is as individual as is a fingerprint. If I say I am a bisexual woman, what does that mean? For me, it means that when I was sexually dating, there were a few times in my life when I was involved with a woman and in love with her. And then there were other times in my life when I was involved with a man and in love with him. And then there were other times, well, there were even times when love had nothing to do with it. Now, I'm not proud of any of this. I'm just speaking frankly. At the beginning of my sexual life, I was all over the place with my choices. But soon my interest in the sexes occurred in phases. I was in a man phase. I was in a woman phase. You know. And if I were involved with one sex and the phase for the other came around, I didn't make a move to the other until the current relationship had ended. And that's only if the phase for the other was still in effect. But even at the height of my dating, my conscience often bothered me when I was involved with a woman. Being in that kind of relationship clashed with the Christian upbringing I had had. So although being with a woman felt very natural to me, very physically satisfying, I was often troubled when I was in that type of relationship, felt guilty. Now, on the other hand, <laughs> I was never too comfortable with men either, because largely because they were not my first choice of partner, uh, but the expected choice. And because often I found that the masculine energy I possess clashed with theirs. So I usually found myself vying with the man rather than sincerely deferring to him. For those reasons, and out of respect for being a mother and having a young son, I was often simply not in a relationship at all, sometimes for years at a time. But I always eventually returned to dating. As I matured, I began to stop dating men altogether because they were unable to hold my attention for very long. On top of that, after about three months of being physically involved with a man, I always began to feel trespassed upon <laughs> and didn't want to be touched anymore. So rather than put me and some nice man through that, I just stopped the process that led, led up to my withdrawing in that way. I, I stopped dating them. But I've always enjoyed flirting with men, still do, especially the ones who are sincerely gentlemanly. And I love it when they find me attractive. And I enjoy conversing with them about neutral topics and public settings, but nothing more intimate than that. In fact, now, if a man shows serious romantic interest in me, I feel threatened and claustrophobic and I pull away. There's only one man from my past who's the, ex the exception to all of this, but if I'm honest with myself, I think I'm relieved really that he doesn't feel that same way about me anymore. Because although I like men, I don't desire to share the last half of my life with one. And when it comes to women over the years, even when I didn't have a love relationship with one special woman, I always tried to maintain a non-sexual close relationship with a woman for whom I felt nothing carnal, you know, just friends in actuality and in thought. For a long time, I didn't understand why I did that. Now I know, I'll, I'll talk about that later. But that's how my bisexuality manifests itself. Now, a woman standing next to me might be bisexual, and she has never slept with a woman. 
I have a character in one of my fictional works, a woman who has been married for 30 years to a man of her youthful dreams, and she has always only slept with him, never been unfaithful. But she has always known that there is a part of her that finds women attractive. She has always known that there is a part of her that would enjoy being with another woman. But she has never acted on that part of her orientation. She has always only expressed her sexual hetero side. And yet, she can still be called bisexual. Because her orientation is there. It's in place. She just hasn't acted on all of it. Another woman might consider herself bisexual, but may not trust men. So she doesn't have relationships with them. She has relationships with women. She trusts women. But she has an urge to be with a man every once in a while, so maybe every once in a while she'll sleep with a man. Hopefully that's while she's not in a relationship with a woman. Another woman might be the opposite. She might only feel comfortable being in relationships with men for social and other reasons, but occasionally she has to sleep with a woman and maybe that happens when she's not in a relationship with a man. Another woman's bisexuality might manifest itself by making her want to have a relationship with a man and one with a woman at the same time. Now with that, especially if the two parties don't know about each other, I think you have something more than just orientation going on there, a character or maturity issue maybe. Still that might be how one woman's bisexuality manifests itself. And then there's that woman who wants a man and a woman in the bed with her at the same time. Now that too might be something more than just orientation. But my point is that having the same orientation label doesn't always mean being the exact same thing. I like to think of these variations as the ingredients in a pot of chicken soup. If you put 20 cooks in one room, and ask them to make chicken soup, I guarantee no two pots of soup will be exactly alike. They'll all have the two basic ingredients, chicken and broth, but the other ingredients will vary. One cook might make his with noodles and peas and corn. Another might use rice and onions and carrots, but in the end, all have pots of chicken soup. And even if some cooks use the exact same ingredients, they won't use those ingredients in the same measure, but they will all still have the same named dish. The same is true with orientation. Bisexuality, homosexuality, heterosexuality are made up of different ingredients for each person. Now I've asserted that orientation is who and what you are and that is not going to change. So what do you do with it when your orientation doesn't match what you believe God wants? The answer to that is found in understanding what it is your orientation needs. I argue that the most important thing your orientation needs is not sex, but the energy you get from someone of the same or the opposite sex. An example. How many of you, before you started living your Christianity, were ever involved with someone sexually, maybe even living together, and yet when you got out of bed, neither of you had anything to say to the other? No conversation, no magnetic attraction between you, completely bored with each other. But you were having sex together. Then someone else in your life walked into your space, and every time the person did, you glowed. You liked being in the presence of that one. He or she fed you something that made you come alive. And yet, you were not sleeping with that individual. You didn't even want to. But you felt for him or her and received from that one the kind of love that feeds what's most important to you, the spirit, the soul. That's the energy your orientation needs. And getting it is what makes you happy and whole, what makes you thrive. So when you become a Christian, the thing you don't want to do is pretend that your other sexual orientation no longer exists. I mean, your orientation is there. It's alive and it has needs and you must feed those needs. If you neglect your orientation, if you pretend you don't have it, you will die. 
Spiritually, you will die. Emotionally, you will be dead. So you want to feed it, but you've got to feed it in a way that pleases God. How do you do that? By getting energy from the type of individual your orientation craves. And what do I mean by energy? It's the spiritual closeness that you get from being with someone, an emotional intimacy, and it has nothing to do with having sex. Now, don't get me wrong. Physical closeness is important. Sexual intimacy is a part of orientation. I'm not saying it isn't. It's there and it's strong. And I'm not saying that we don't crave sex with the opposite or the same. What I'm saying is that it's such a fleeting part. The pleasure doesn't last long. But the love that you get from someone, that spiritual intimacy that you get from another human being, you can feel that whether the other person is present or not. You can recall it and it can nurture you and support you when the other person is nowhere around. It's infinitely more profound and powerful than carnal physical pleasure. And so it's really a gift God gives us. Now that spiritual association, that emotional intimacy is what I had once upon a time. That's why I'm talking to you, because I feel I made a mistake more than 20 years ago. I left a treasure chest of good female friends that now that I think back on it, I believe God sent to me because he knew what my orientation was. He knew that I was a bisexual child even before I knew it. But he also knew that I was striving to serve him in righteousness and with a good heart and according to my understanding of the Bible and of the religious organization of which I was a part. So I can imagine God looking down at me and saying, I see this girl. I know what she is. I know what she's trying to do. So let me give her that which her orientation needs in order for her to continue serving me. So he gave me 10 good friends, ranging in age from mid-teens to elderly, all female, who fed my orientation of the different types of fuel that it needed in order to thrive. I really do believe that. 10 females who were as close to me as sisters, or were motherly figures who gave good advice, or were younger ones who inspired me because they said they looked up to me. They were God's gift to me designed to satisfy my orientation and make me stay in place so that I wouldn't feel the need to go out and satisfy my orientation in the wrong way. But I didn't see that at the time. I walked away. And here's what I want you to think about. If you are part of a religious group and you're thinking of leaving it because of your orientation, you might want to rethink that. The organization I was a part of contains some of the most honest, orderly, and polite people I've ever known. So to leave these polite, law-abiding people, people who are brainwashed to be that way, was a mistake. Now, and I say brainwashed without meaning to be insulting. I think any effective organization brainwashes its members so that they can be uniform in thought and action. And my former associates are brainwashed to be good people, to be loyal employees, to be peaceful. So I left peaceful, good people because I thought I wasn't good enough to hang with them. And I'll tell you why I felt that way. I had been a devoted member of this organization. I had been raised in it. And at 15, I made a decision to formally join it. Now, I was a child who loved to read and do research. So when I was serving as one of their street ministers in my early 20s and realized that this other sexual part of me was not going away despite my devotion to this organization, I began to do research about what this religion's leader said about it. And guess what? I found that in more than a century of publishing books, including encyclopedias, and magazines and pamphlets about their beliefs. In more than 100 years of disseminating dozens of titles and millions of pieces of literature, they had never discussed female same sexuality, except in one reference, one or two sentences, in which they brushed it off as a non-sexual crush a girl might have on a teacher. Now, I understand that now they have discussed the real thing briefly, but at that time, 
in more than a hundred years, they had not discussed what I was. So how did I interpret that? Well, as a young person who allowed this organization to tell me everything I should do in life, including not to go to college when I was college material, I also looked to them to tell me how to feel about this part of me. And when I didn't find anything in their literature about female same sexuality, I began to reason that what I was was so bad, they couldn't even talk about it. What I was was so bad, it didn't exist in the narrative of their organization. And so if what I am doesn't exist in the tradition of their literature, then maybe I shouldn't exist in their organization. And so I left feeling unworthy. So that's the mistake I don't want you all to make. There were a couple of other factors involved in my leaving, but that was one of the underlying ones that played a big part in my decision to walk away. So if you're part of a Christian way of worship that has good things about it and you really don't want to leave it, don't leave for the reason I left. Now, if you have some other reason you're going to leave, I have nothing to do with that. But if you're going to leave because of your orientation, you're disappointed in having it, reconsider that. I'm going to stop here with this and take a break, give you time to do something you need to do. Afterwards, I'll talk about why my leaving because of my orientation was a mistake for a different reason. I'll discuss that when we come back. My mistake in letting my orientation drive me away from the Christian religion of which I had been a part is this. I thought that because there was a part of me that I didn't put in me that conflicted with what the Bible said, but was still an intractable part of me, I had an excuse not to serve God. What I thought was this, look. I didn't make me bisexual or same sex. I didn't make me this way and it's not going anywhere. And I've pleaded with God to help me get rid of it. And he hasn't. So I guess I have an excuse not to do what this religion says I should do. Well, guess what? No matter what is your orientation, you still have to suppress and contain it in order to serve God acceptably as a Christian. No matter what is your orientation. See, I didn't realize that 24 years ago. If I had, maybe I wouldn't have felt like a special case and thought that I had an excuse to give up. If you're a single heterosexual person, what does that mean you're not supposed to do? You know it. You're not supposed to have sex before marriage or outside of marriage. Now, you might say to God, look, God, I'm sexy. I'm young. I'm fine, available. What do you mean? I'm, I can't have sex. My orientation demands that I have sex with someone of the opposite sex. I didn't make me this way. You made me this way. And you know what I need. What would God say? Of course, I don't speak for God, but I imagine he would say, one man, one woman in marriage. That's it. Now, of course, God allowed humans to deviate from that standard in the days of the biblical patriarchs. But in the Garden of Eden, God laid down the standard. One man, one woman, brought together by someone with authority. And when Christ came, he indicated by his words that he supported that original institution. And if you are a part of a Christian religion, 
unless it's the fundamental LDS, I would dare say that your Christian religion demands that you follow that Garden of Eden, Christ-affirmed standard of one man and one woman only. So even if you are a healthy, red-blooded, single heterosexual, you don't get a pass. You're not supposed to have sex outside of marriage, no matter what they do on TV. You have to contain and control your heterosexual orientation in order to please God. Now, if you are married and heterosexual, you still don't have it easy. Remember I said that every orientation label means something different in each person. This person's heterosexuality might make it less of a challenge for him to remain monogamous. He might have a low sex drive, or maybe he has a strong drive, but an even stronger sense of devotion to fidelity. Another person's heterosexuality, however, might be designed to want sex so much <laughs> that it trumps all reason. The person might say, God, you know how I'm made. You know how my people are. We're high strung. We've got to have it all the time. In fact, your heterosexual appetite might be so voracious one person can't satisfy you. So what, is God going to make an exception for you and allow you to go outside the marriage because you're strung that way, you're wired that way? No. He's going to say, one man, one woman, in marriage. That's it. His rules don't change just because your orientation has elements of voracity in it. Now, you might be a married heterosexual whose orientation doesn't need sex so much as much as it wants it with different people. It needs variety. You, you get easily bored with one person. Or you could be someone who so enjoys the, the company of members of the opposite sex that you simply want to be surrounded by them all the time. So is God going to alter his standard and say, okay, you can have a harem? No. For you, he's going to say the same thing he says to the other heterosexuals today. One marital partner. And that's hard. To be married and only sleep with one person for the rest of your life, that's hard for most people, I would say. But it's a requirement for you if you want to be an honest follower of your Christian religion. Now you might ask, why must there be restrictions in serving God as a Christian? Well, because stepping into the Christian way of life is in some ways like stepping into and living in a box. Now I know there are some of you who will say, what do you mean? Christ said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Yeah, but not free to do whatever you want. There are rules you have to follow as a Christian. It's like a parent who puts a baby in a child-protected room, a child-protected environment, like putting it in a box. Parents will cover the electrical outlets so that the child can't stick anything in there. They'll anchor the furniture so that the, it doesn't topple over onto the child. They'll put up a gate so that the baby can't go downstairs or upstairs or out the door. Now, why does a parent do that? Is it because the parent doesn't love the child? No, it's because the parent does love the child and knows that there are dangers in this world that are bigger than the child can deflect or comprehend. And so the parent is trying to keep the child away from these dangers by putting it in a protected environment, in a room with restrictions. Well, it's the same with us and God. He knows that there are dangers all around us, many we can see, but some we can't see because they emanate from another dimension. But God knows through which portals those dangers enter into our dimension. So he puts up rules that restrict us from going near those ports of evil entry. And just as a parent doesn't always explain to a child why the child can't do certain things, God doesn't always tell us why we shouldn't do this or that. We don't tell children sometimes because we know they wouldn't understand. Try explaining to a two-year-old why he shouldn't walk across a street or go to a molester who's holding out a piece of candy. The child wouldn't get it. 
So there are some things God doesn't tell us the reasons for. He just says, don't do it. And he says this because he loves us and wants to protect us and set us free from unnecessary hardships. Now that doesn't mean we're always going to like what he says. <laughs> Believe you me, I don't like that the Bible doesn't affirm female to female sexuality. Especially when I was a young adult trying to find myself. I scoured the Bible trying to find something that would give me an excuse to feel the way I felt. But it wasn't in there and I didn't like that. And we're not always going to like being in this box of Christianity. A child, especially after a certain age, doesn't like being confined to a room, especially if the child sees other children playing outside or it's a sunny day or the ice cream truck goes by. But staying inside saves him from the cars that could crush him or the predators who would snatch him or the dog that would eat him alive. And good things come to us if we remain in our God-protected environment of Christianity. That's why, as a heterosexual married person and a heterosexual single person, you've got to beat your orientation into submission in order to serve God acceptably. Now, what about bisexuals and homosexuals? It's harder for you. Let's not pretend it's it's not. Let's start with what's the easier of the two and what I understand most, bisexuals. Since you're part hetero and part homo, God has part of you to work with. <laughs> he can tease up that hetero part of you and find somebody who appeals to you so that you can have a legitimate sex partner in marriage, if marriage is what you want. At the same time, you can pray to God to do for you what he did for me give you friends of the same sex who can feed that part of your orientation that needs same sex energy because that part of your orientation will still be in place even if you're married. I suspect that some bisexuals subconsciously fill this need by joining same sex organizations such as sororities and fraternities or they enroll at all female or all male learning institutions because they know they're gonna be surrounded by the energy that makes them feel good. Now I have no proof of that, it's just a theory, but if it's true, I think it's a healthy choice. For me, I cope by doing things that satisfy both sides of my orientation. Right now I choose to work in a male dominated profession, which allows me to interact professionally with men and to receive flirtation attention from them. You know, which, you know, satisfies a hetero woman in me. I satisfy my other side by submerging myself in the artistic creations of women, especially song. My orientation loves the sound of a beautiful female singing voice, so I feed it that on a regular basis. I love reading fiction and spiritual writings that were developed in the minds of intelligent women. And always I need spiritual intimacy with at least one woman, especially since I made the decision in the summer of 2014 to no longer keep myself open to the possibility of being physically with a woman. Ever since then, God has given me wonderful interactions with women. These are women, one of which I was involved with physically in the past, but now we, we have a beautiful spiritual thing because we have both uh, dedicated our lives to doing things God's way. The other women I, I was never involved with, they just feed my soul. And I realize now that I always sought to have a close platonic female friend, not only because such a relationship satisfies my need for same-sex energy, but also because the hetero woman in me needs a sisterly friend. And now I have that. And while it's not 10 close friends this time, I realize that at this stage in my life, I don't need that many. The older you get, the harder it is to carry around heavy things anyway. <laughs> so instead of a chest of good friends, I now carry a small bag of precious gems, quality women. So God is good. You give up something for him, he gives you something back. 
Now, if you are homosexual, male or female, I am not even going to pretend I understand how it feels to be completely not attracted to the opposite sex. But I do know that your path as a Christian is not an easy one. But guess what? Serving God is not easy. Serving God, in fact, has never been easy. Think about Jesus. How did he live? On the run from people seeking to kill him. Slandered. How did he die? An awful, torturous death. We know about it. The people who followed him were thrown into arenas for others to watch while lions ate them alive. They were whipped. Some were beheaded, thrown into prison, stoned to death. Go back before Christ to the Israelites. If you were an able-bodied Israelite man, you were expected to suit up, go to battle, take your sword and run it through the body of another man or else have it run through you. And you did that because Yahweh, Jehovah, commanded that the Israelites kill in order to take over the land God had promised them. So your worship required that you kill or be killed. I'm going to tell you right now, if I were an able-bodied Israelite man, I wouldn't have wanted to do that. But that's what they had to do. If it's a command from their God, as they believed it to be, then obeying it was worship. Not easy to do. And I wouldn't have wanted to do it. If you are a man from the tribe of Levi, you were exempt from military service, but you still had to kill on a regular basis. The Levitical priests had to slaughter animals. They had to carve them up, bleed them, dip their fingers in the blood, spatter the blood on the altar, all of this to make sacrifices for the Israelites. Again, I wouldn't have wanted to do it. But it was required as part of their worship. So worshiping God, in the Judeo-Christian tradition anyway, has never been easy. And if it wasn't easy for those in ancient times and not easy for the one who inspired Christianity, why should you, homosexual, expect that serving God would be easy for you? In fact, Jesus indicated that following him was not going to be an easy venture. What did he say? In Matthew chapter 5, he said, If your eye offends you, pluck it out, because it's better to go into life with one eye than to be cast into Gehenna with two eyes. Gehenna was a valley outside the walls of Jerusalem where people used to burn children as sacrifices to an idol god. In Jesus' day, the valley had come to represent a place of eternal destruction. So he said, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better to enter into life with one hand than to be thrown into Gehenna or into hell with two hands. Now, what does he mean by that? I think he means this. If there is something about you that prevents you from serving God acceptably, get rid of it. Even if getting rid of it is as hard as it would be for you to pluck out an eye or to cut off a limb. Yes, your homosexual orientation is as much a part of you as is your hand, as is your eye. And yet, in order to serve God acceptably, you have to get it under control. Now, of course, it doesn't seem fair that you, the homosexual, have to give up the only type of sex your orientation wants. But there's no way around what the Bible says about it. It doesn't approve. And we can't change that fact. Just as the orientation of grains and wood doesn't change, and the orientation of you or I doesn't change, the words in the Bible don't change. And if we believe God inspired the writing of the Bible, then we have to go with what's in it. And it's not changing and suddenly saying that homosexuality is okay, no matter what they say. In Hollywood. So to live in step with the Bible, you as a homosexual have to heavily rely on God. Now, I personally don't believe that God will change you. 
not just because it didn't happen in my life and not because I don't think God can. With him, all things are possible, but I don't think it's probable. God can give you the power to cope, but I don't think he promises to remove your orientation. I think the reason some homosexuals become suicidal is because they're expecting God to change them. And when he doesn't, they feel like failures as Christians. So don't expect him to change you. And let's assume he's not going to change you. What do you do? Well, there's nothing by about you, so there's nothing he can tease up. But it's not a hopeless cause. Remember what I said at the beginning of this discussion, that your orientation is about so much more than who you want to sleep with. Well, even if you can't act upon the sexual part of your nature, you can indulge in the other aspects of your orientation. You might love beautifying things, and you do it well. How many home decorators and fashion designers are also male homosexuals? You might be a good cook, have an eye for detail, or a master at making plants grow. Whatever are the non-sexual aspects of your orientation, you can still cherish and enhance those and keep that part of your orientation alive so that you can thrive. And if you, the homosexual, sacrifice the sex part of your orientation for God, I don't think he takes that lightly. Even as humans, we show appreciation for someone who makes a great sacrifice for us. Why would we expect anything less from God? So for the homosexual who cuts off a hand for the sake of being a Christian, the Creator can give you that beautiful intimacy that we talked about earlier, that spiritual closeness with someone of the same sex, a wholesome closeness. And who knows, because with God all things are possible, he might even, if you want it, find someone of the opposite sex that you can tolerate enough to want to marry. God is the great matchmaker, so it wouldn't be hard for him to place you with someone of the opposite sex who happens to have much of the energy of your sex, the thing your orientation needs. But even if not that, there are always the other aspects of your orientation that God can bless. In fact, I think I've seen evidence of God highly blessing homosexuals in one of the other facets of their orientation. Music making, for instance, simply because he knows what they're giving up for him. So trust in his fairness and see what he'll do for you. For all Christian other sexuals, loving and embracing the positive aspects of your orientation is the goal. But so is conquering that part of your orientation that does not line up with Christianity. To do that, you have to be honest with yourself about what it is you are and how you have to treat it. Don't pretend that you don't have another sexual orientation or that you don't have urges and fantasies from time to time. In fact, I think it's healthy to admit what you are. If you pretend, for instance, that you don't have cancer, you won't treat it, will you? Now, I'm not saying our orientation is a cancer. I'm just saying, I'm just using this example to say, if you pretend that you don't have an orientation that is out of step with your Christianity, you won't pay attention to it, and it'll sneak up on you, and it'll catch you, and you'll slip. Now that can happen even when you have an eye on it, but let's help it by acknowledging it. If you acknowledge what you are to yourself, and maybe to someone close to you, then you have decided to pay attention to the thing and can keep control of it. But if you don't even acknowledge something exists, you're not going to try to master it. It's okay to say, I am a homosexual man, but I'm trying to serve God. It's okay to say, I am a woman who is bisexual, but I'm trying to do things God's way. It's okay to refuse to read certain books, including mine, or to watch certain movies or TV shows because you know they will take your mind someplace you don't want it to go. Whatever it takes to conquer your orientation, do it. And in return, what is God going to do for you? Just as he gave me 10 beautiful female friends that fed my orientation, 
He can do the same thing for you and give you people who satisfy what is the most important part of your orientation, that energy need, that intimacy need. Don't do as I did. Don't cast aside the most beautiful part of your orientation's need to go after the fleshly and the carnal. As long as I was reaching out for the fleshly relationships with women, I did not have the beautiful spiritual relationships with women. But as soon as I told God that I would stop leaving myself open to the carnal, he gave me a beautiful, loving, close, spiritual relationship with a woman in Atlanta that I have long respected. It took me 23 years of hard-headedness to finally trust God enough to let go of my devotion to my orientation. And I thank a dear woman of God in North Carolina who said the right words that made that possible for me. But 23 years of my reaching out and getting what I wanted the way I wanted it, satisfying my orientation the way I wanted to, instead of letting God satisfy it the way he wanted to. Now, is it still a struggle for me? Of course. My biggest battle, though, is not keeping away from an actual woman, but from the fictional women who live in my head, the ones whose stories I wrote before I arrived at this point in my journey. Because my orientation inserts itself into every major thing I do, my stories always take on this theme. And I have created appealing female protagonists whose stories I can recall at any time. Even those parts of the stories that work against my desire to not cultivate the homosexual part of my bisexuality. So I am my greatest enemy in this battle to conquer my orientation. But God, in his goodness, has helped me keep the promise I made to him. And I can tell you this. There is nothing more beautiful than having trust and genuine love with someone of the same sex if you are other sexual. And I have that once again in my life. So let God work that miracle for you. Because see, if you step into the box of Christianity, it won't always be a box. Think about Adam and Eve. They were placed in Eden. It was so small in size compared to the rest of the earth, you could have considered it a box. A beautiful box, but a small place nonetheless. But what would have happened if they had obeyed God's commands and honored the restrictions he placed upon them in that garden? They would have multiplied and spread Eden all over the earth until eventually they would have been no longer in a small box-like paradise, but a global one. The same can happen with us. If we do what God wants us to do, even with something as intrinsic as orientation, we'll one day discover that our personal world has blossomed and spread and become an existence that not only pleases God, but satisfies the deepest needs of our orientation. Thank you.